Global Governance Futures is brought to you from the Global Governance Institute at University College London. This is a podcast about the challenges facing humanity and possible global responses. How does the world hang together? What has gone wrong? And what has global governance got to do with it? To learn more, please visit ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance. It was a real treat to have Adrian Bueller join us for this episode of the podcast. Adrian is not only an incredibly articulate and thoughtful commentator on one of the biggest challenges of our times, she's also a recent star alumni of our Global Governance and Ethics Master's program here at University College London. Adrian has been busy since graduating, cutting her teeth at the coalface of climate policy as co-director of the campaign group Labour for a Green New Deal through 2017 and 2018, and since emerging as a major new voice on the left for a just green transition. Somehow, she's also found time to write two books, including the focus of our conversation, The Value of a Whale. This new book is a powerful depth charge aimed at unmasking the ideological commitments of the new kid on the capitalist block, green capitalism. Presented as common sense solution to the climate emergency, Adrian's probing inquiry exposes why the logic of green capitalism, above all the reduction of all life to economic value, all but guarantees failure because this is a system that demands and requires exploitation to continue to reproduce itself. Going forward, it is completely non-viable if the principle we're starting from is we want a world in which broadly, you know, everyone has the means to live like a comfort, comfortable, fulfilled life in which, you know, we aren't teetering on the cliff edge of a climate crisis in which, you know, biodiversity loss is not only halted, but reversed. You know, all of these things are, I think, kind of fundamentally irreconcilable with with uh, sort of market dynamics and with capitalism as a system. This is Imperfect Utopias or Bust, Global Governance Futures. Adrian is the Director of Research at Commonwealth, an organization focused on promoting democratic ownership to transform how the economy operates and for whom. Adrian is a writer, activist, and scholar, the author of two books on the climate crises and post-pandemic politics, and she is also a regular contributor to the New Statesman, The Guardian, and other media outlets. We spoke in October 2022. To start, um, I wanted a question that that was that would introduce you in your career, even though it is so um, quite illustrious and interesting. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, upon reading the preface of your new book, The Value of a Whale, um, I was struck by your uh, your commentary on, I believe it was the summer of 2020, um, with the, the wildfires in the West and the, and the flooding in Europe and in, in, in Pakistan. And there was one sentence that was particularly striking. And that sentence was, it is deceptively easy to become adjusted to catastrophe. I thought that that really resonated with me. And I think that, uh, that phrase is, is one of the pitfalls to proactive policymaking. Um, and we can explore that further, but I wanted to, to ask you, this element of catastrophe, was that the main motivator for you in, in moving into, into the career that you've chosen and did it at all play into the, the decision you had to study global governance at the start? And um, how have you, this is kind of a multi-part question, so <laughs> let me repeat some elements, but um, how have you uh, sort of kept yourself from becoming adjusted to catastrophe um, as it's unfolded around us? Yeah, very good multi-part question. Um, yeah, I think uh, what initially got me into sort of working on climate change and on sort of ecological crisis, it's a mix of factors, basically. Um, I mean, I was lucky enough, as I talked about in the sort of beginning of the book, to have grown up in just the incredibly beautiful city of Vancouver, British Columbia, which is basically a gift um, that also made me completely fascinated by and sort of um, addicted to sort of the natural world and really curious about it. And then also very exposed at the same time to uh, an incredibly kind of resource extractive uh, sort of province and country that really organizes its economy around, you know, forestry and mining and all these kinds of things where uh, I became sort of immediately exposed to sort of ecological degradation on quite an extreme scale as well from a young age. 
So I always found both of those things very fascinating and kind of compelling. Um, and I initially went to study kind of sciences and engineering. I thought about being sort of a renewable resource engineer. Um, but then exactly the point that you're talking about there, which is the kind of steady drumbeat of what felt like and still feels like escalating kind of catastrophe around the climate kind of compelled me into the global governance program at, at UCL to kind of, yeah, basically understand or try to unpack how global politics works and how, you know, we organize systems to try to address global problems when we don't technically have a global government government, and sort of how you navigate that terrain. Um, and that was, yeah, basically what compelled me into that space. Um, and I did all my kind of courses and my thesis focused around, around the climate. Um, and since then have sort of worked, I went initially to work for um, a kind of non-political organization called Influence Map, um, who do excellent work sort of tracking corporate lobbying on the climate crisis. Um, and I sort of worked in their finance program and came away from it a little bit cynical about um, some of the issues I unpack in the book around kind of just engaging with the financial system to try and make it a little bit better. And that sort of um, compelled me into the more political space um, that I now operate in, um, which is basically focused on overtly kind of political and policy-based solutions to uh, to the crises that we're facing. I'm not sure if that hit all of the points of your multifaceted question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it did. Thank you. Um, and certainly, I think uh, I I am a uh, uh, rural-like in that I was also drawn to global governance because of it's really the only area that has us analyze, you know, how we're dealing with global problems without a global government and how our systems come together. Um, in terms of becoming, making sure you don't become adjusted to, to catastrophe, um, how has your work helped uh, temper that, that, uh, that, that odd, that odd um, ability of humans to just kind of live and let live um, as things continue to get worse and worse? Yeah, I have to say it's um, it's very difficult to not both become adjusted to catastrophe and also become sort of complacent insofar as if you're someone who cares about climate and ecological crisis, maybe you're an activist, maybe it's just something that you follow in your life. Um, we get so little give on any kind of positive news in that kind of space, any kind of really material kind of <laughs> strong action on the climate crisis that... Um, working in policy, it's often easy to slip into a space where like any kind of concession uh, we should celebrate. Um, and it's easy to kind of accept crumbs when we need to be asking for the world, basically, because that's what's at stake. Um, so I think the thing that keeps me from becoming too complacent um, or at least disillusioned is, you know, while I work in a think tank and while I work in policy, um, I still try to sort of always go to as many kind of demos as I can and to remain kind of tapped into um, social movements um, and engaged with both kind of movement activists as well as sort of working in our work with um, trade unions, um, trying to understand basically the intersections of this with, you know, the cost of living crisis and sort of crises that everyone is facing in their daily lives rather than trying to just kind of withdraw into this more kind of abstracted policy space. And in terms of catastrophe, I mean, you know, we are in a position, you know, based as we are in the UK or, or Geneva, if you're, if you're Tom H or, you know, Canada, if you're Jessica or myself sometimes, you know, we live in societies that are comparatively kind of sheltered from the impacts of the climate crisis and, you know, better placed to adapt to it. Um, and so I think, you know, it's really important to just kind of regularly check in on how easy it is to kind of ignore uh, everything that's happening in the world around us from our position of relative comfort. Um, I can't say I'm perfect at doing that, but it's something that I try to be like very intentional about um, in terms of not forgetting, you know, just how high the stakes are right now for, for people all around the world. So it was a real pleasure to have you on the, uh, the program, AJN in 2017. What I didn't realize was that you were very busy outside the classroom as well. So, so you arrived in the UK in, in, in 2017 at the height of, of Corbynism, just we can. And, uh, you know, it, it was a, was a very unusual moment in British politics. And of course, climate issues also rose up the ranks in terms of having real visibility in the political conversation nationally. Mm -hmm. And it so happened that you became co-director of the campaign group Labour for a Green New Deal. Mm 
uh, at, at this time, I think, while you were still studying. Uh, so perhaps you could give us a little taste of what it was like to, to engage at the, <laughs> the coalface of, of politics, um, what it was like to interact with people in, in the corridors of power. And um, what lessons did you did you take from your experience, uh, sort of actually doing doing the hard work of trying to convince political representatives to to pursue a more radical green agenda? Oh God, many lessons. Yeah, Labour for a Green New Deal was a challenging experience. Um, so, as you pointed out, you know, we started the campaign at a very unique time. Um, for kind of left politics um, in in the UK, you know, had a resurgence that, you know, hadn't existed for kind of decades in terms of widespread popularity of a lot of the kind of ideas that uh, are embodied by a Green New Deal, whether that's, you know, public ownership in key systems like energy, or whether that's, you know, really strengthening um, organized labor, I guess it's a North American term. So like the trade union movement would be the, the UK terminology for it. Um, and I think, yeah, so we kind of came in with a ton of energy and a lot of optimism and kind of idealism about what was achievable, um, which I think was actually very important to the kind of relative successes of the campaign. I'll caveat that by saying, you know, the campaign was fairly successful within the Labour Party itself. There were a lot of factors, obviously, that resulted in, in that not being realized in the 2019 election. Um, but I think, you know, what what we learned as as organizers is that, you know, idealism is absolutely the place to begin, because no matter what you propose to politics, it will, you know, invariably get shipped away um, as you kind of engage with various kind of interests in different parties. And so rather than try to kind of enter the room from this position that we sometimes felt we had to be at of, you know, we want to appear serious and credible and, you know, that might make us kind of water down what our demands are. It turns out that, you know, being incredibly effective relies on, you know, being true to your ideals while also sort of understanding that you need to kind of build power on the ground and pressure from the outside in order to get anything you want. You know, a good example of that is what's happened with um, the IRA, excellently named bill in the US. Um, you know, that's definitely not something that most activists would consider a Green New Deal. However, you know, it marks a huge departure from the kinds of thinking around climate policy that have always existed in the United States. You know, it's broadly always been centered around carbon pricing and the idea of creating a carbon market. And thanks to the kind of tireless and some would say idealistic or kind of utopian activism and visions of people organizing around a Green New Deal um, and organizing for climate justice, you know, we have a total transformation in the way that climate politics is understood in the U.S., even if it's not sort of attributed to those groups, they absolutely created the space for the kind of much smaller and, you know, it has its own flaws kind of policy that we have, but they created the space for that to be possible at all. And I think that was our experience as well is, you know, the Labour Party now is a very different beast than it was when I was, you know, working with the campaign. Um, but, uh, you know, the fact that they have tried to center, at least in most recent Labour conference, for example, have begun to sort of center questions around climate and energy again sort of in their politics rather than backing away from it, um, I think speaks to the success of, you know, not just Labour for a Green New Deal, but a lot of kind of organized movements and, and pressure applied uh, to, to politicians. It's an exhausting task, though, would be the final thing I would say, <laughs> is that it requires, you know, a lot of kind of dogged energy and a lot of very unglamorous work by a lot of people who basically never get kind of any visibility or, or thanks for what they do. I was reading, oh, as part of the uh, preparation for this, I read a Jeff Mann piece from August 2022 in the LRB, called mm -hmm. Reversing the Freight Train, you know, the case for degrowth, which I think is a mm -hmm. great name. Um, and he talked about the tension, or at least lots of people who are in favor of a Green New Deal or recognize the ecological catastrophe also recognize that we need to have massively increased democratization of politics, of the way that the economy works. But there's also that tension that in order to reverse the freight train, it's this massive thing that needs doing, there's the fear that it will be a top-down elite driven process. So do you think this is a false dichotomy or do you think that there is, how can we make the Green New Deal a grassroots kind of democratizing thing rather than imposed from the top? 
Yeah, I mean, very good question. Would that I had the perfect answer to this, obviously kind of a, an eternal problem to be wrestled with. Um, I think, and again, this is something that uh, I love that piece by Jeff Mann, by the way. Great, great piece. Um, this is something that I try to wrestle with in the book as well, right? Is again, this idea that like, because we are so desperate for the absolutely necessary and overdue kind of scale of action that we need on the climate and ecological crisis, it's very easy to kind of, fall prey to potentially, you know, just have kind of a, a climate now, as some people have described it, come in and kind of authoritarian deliver the kind of policies that we need. So democratization for me goes hand in hand with not only climate justice, but actually kind of any real action that is effective and that has political buy-in. Um, and that is one of the biggest problems that climate politics has faced to date, right, is that it has been perceived, whether that's legitimate or not, often as the domain of kind of the political elite perceived as this kind of borderline apolitical, purely kind of technocratic problem. And that has been deeply alienating to exactly the kinds of political constituencies that you need in order to sort of win climate politics. Broadly, that is sort of the global working class, that's organized labor in the US and the UK, um, and people all around the world who are, you know, facing the sharp end of this crisis, um, currently have the least voice in how we respond to it. And um, that is something that I think if we are to have any kind of scale of climate politics that reflects the urgency of this crisis um, will require a tremendous amount of political buy-in that, frankly, no one has yet achieved. Um, and I think democratizing processes are, again, key to that. So I'll, you know, return to the IRA again as an example, just because it's recent and salient, not because I think it is, you know, without flaw. Um, but again, you know, a lot of the arrival at that was a highly democratic process that involved kind of a lot of consultation um, with with sort of the climate movement. Now, they didn't get by any stretch everything that they wanted. But what did enter the bill was kind of a design that basically leaves how to deliver a lot of this infrastructure up to, for example, local municipalities and communities who can basically access this newly unlocked climate funding um, to deliver the projects that they sort of determine to be the most necessary in their community, whether that's on clean energy or sort of new transport infrastructures. And that's just kind of one micro version of the way that this can become sort of a much more democratic exercise about how we kind of allocate our resources um, and how we sort of build an alternative future. And I should say that, you know, for me, green capitalism, which is the kind of framework that I use throughout the book, um, the big takeaway that I have is that it is a very deliberate exercise in kind of anti-democratic um, and sort of apolitical um, responses to, to the climate crisis, right? It kind of describes um, a world in which everything is left to, to the market to sort of allocate uh, resources and to determine the future we want to have um, as this kind of imagined democratic authority, when obviously we know that the vast majority of people are totally locked out of having a say over sort of market processes at any kind of scale um, that has impact. Um, and I think that's a huge problem for the success of any, or the viability rather, of any kind of project to, you know, not only reach net zero by 2050, if that's your target, but to do so in a way that reflects, you know, kind of any degree of, of justice or, you know, builds a world that isn't just decarbonized, but is like worth living in, frankly. <laughs> that's super interesting. And I think just to clarify, the IRA is the Inflation Reduction Act for people that might confuse it with the Irish terrorist group. Um, but pivoting from the, the US perhaps to the UK, um, and I know that maybe we didn't prepare for this question, but, you know, fracking is back in the news mm. and the development and sale of new oil and gas licenses in the North Sea in the name of energy security as a result of conflict in Ukraine. What's your perspective on this? How likely do you think um, the UK is in achieving something like the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, something that's not perfect, but going towards the right in the right direction of, let's say, a Green New Deal, not Green New Deal, but, you know, fixing environmental problems. I know that the UK has particular issues around water quality, which is really poor and sad. Um, but yeah, uh, can you speak to the British uh, environment perhaps a bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So the UK has quite an interesting, troubling, I would say, mix of factors in terms of how our climate politics will play out. On the one hand, you have a situation totally different than the US in as much as 
at least until very recently, you know, the conservative party of the UK, and this is quite unusual with, you know, center right parties around the world, um, particularly, you know, opposed to the Republicans, for example, who I wouldn't necessarily describe as center right. Um, but, you know, there's no kind of overt climate denialism as sort of a core tenet of conservative politics in the UK. That's obviously changing a little bit with the installation of people like Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, in the Bayes office, um, who has a history of contesting the science of the climate crisis, um, and a few kind of others who've been appointed to the current kind of cabinet or advisory roles. Um, so that is maybe changing a bit, but, you know, we do ultimately have a country in which the Conservative Party enacted, you know, a net zero by 2050 kind of target um, and, you know, was calling under Boris Johnson for a green industrial revolution, you know, disingenuously or otherwise. That is a fundamentally different kind of state of affairs politically to e.g. the U.S. or even, you know, parts of Canada where, you know, the idea that action on the climate crisis is necessary at all remains hugely contested. Um, at the same time, yeah, we have in the UK across a lot of the systems that are so critical to decarbonization, whether that's transport or, or the energy system itself or, or water, if we're talking about the environmental issue, you know, we have the most excessively and irrationally privatized delivery of a lot of these systems compared to most other economies in the world, right? We are absolutely amazing at privatizing every possible element of a system into various different, you know, markets that kind of interact and add costs at every stage and also add complexity when it comes to sort of coordinating what ultimately needs to be like a planned transition away from fossil fuels or towards a much more ecologically sustainable use of water, for example, um, and so that presents real challenges because this isn't just a task of, you know, setting a target and sort of letting it rip. We have a system that is basically designed to slow that process um, and everything is kind of oriented around market dynamics that, you know, will not deliver, a, you know, a decarbonized energy system, a decarbonized transit system that provides for everyone affordably just kind of by design. So that does present, I think, real challenges because you can't engage on the climate and environmental question in the UK without engaging on questions around sort of privatized um, public infrastructure. Uh, and that is a really kind of, it's a political hot potato, I guess, if you will, not just for the conservatives, but also for, you know, Keir Starmer's labor, which frankly has as one of its <laughs> core missions, you know, differentiate itself from Jeremy Corbyn. And because, you know, the Corbyn era was one that talked very openly about, you know, the public popularity of sort of nationalizing key industries, that's something that, again, is now going to be difficult and something that sort of activists need to push for and win um, in this Labour Party, which is very different. Um, the good news is also that public ownership of key things like rail and water and energy is actually very popular um, across the UK public, um, including, you know, in some sections of the sort of Conservative Party. So there's some some ground to be won there um, if that's pushed into. Um, so a big mix of politics there, um, which creates a lot of challenges. I think the one thing I would say to fracking, and maybe this is overly optimistic, is I do think it's a bit of a, I think it's a bit of a red herring insofar as even the kind of boss of Quadrilla or Quadria, however you say it, um, has made comments around the fact that fracking is economically unviable in the UK. So even the fracking industry doesn't want to frack in the UK. And you'll never kind of get consent from local communities. And that's something that the Conservatives have at least gestured towards feeling like they need to do. Um, and so I think that's more of kind of a public posturing kind of announcement rather than something that will be actually realized. And the one problem there, I guess, is it suggests that this is an administration that's very interested in appearing like it doesn't want to act on the climate crisis. So that is troubling. But there are sort of some basic infrastructures there in terms of, you know, political concern across the spectrum around the climate crisis that gives us uh, an easier kind of battle to fight than what I think a lot of people in the U.S. are, are facing. Thank you for indulging in that conversation. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And um, I now pass over to, to Tom to, I think, ask about specifically the, the book that you've just written. I think we could talk about British politics yeah. for the rest of the hour, but but let's let's try not to. Uh, we did have a, a someone on last year, Vinay Gupta, who was very exercised about what was going on in the Labour Party, and he uh, he kind of asked the question whether Corbyn was the last shot for the Labour Party to escape neoliberalism, mm. uh, neoliberal policies on climate, 
And I guess maybe if we were to segue to the core argument in your book, which I think is is related, I mean, you essentially make the claim, the argument that green capitalism is a contradiction in terms. And I think for many people, neoliberalism goes hand in hand with green capitalism. So perhaps you can help us unpack what, what's, what is the core problem with the green capitalist agenda? Yeah, big question. Very good question. Um, well, so I think that the way I'll start to answer this is that what I try and do in, in the book is appraise kind of green capitalism on its own terms. So I kind of broadly, you can understand that as most policies that whether it's the European Union or in the UK or you know Canada and the US, most policies currently being pursued around uh, climate crisis are uh, broadly aligned with the green capitalist framework, whether that's this idea that like it all needs to be about sort of incentivizing and subsidizing benefits for private investors or whether it's about, you know, carbon pricing as the kind of be all and end all and all sorts of kind of conventional tools that many people would be familiar with. Um, that's kind of what we're seeing broadly across um, governments that are in power and acting on the climate crisis. Um, and I think, you know, what I try to do, as I said, is, you know, evaluate in their own terms, whether those are solutions worth pursuing in terms of a kind of you know, perfect as enemy of the good kind of framework. Will these actually deliver something when it comes to, you know, cutting carbon emissions, delivering climate justice that makes them better than nothing? Um, and I guess the answer that I arrive at broadly across the board um, is, is kind of no. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, a lot of this comes down to the fact that, you know, there's a kind of fundamental misreading of the way that we can resolve this problem that is core to, to green capitalism, which is that this is just kind of a, a basic market failure. Um, and, you know, the way to address that is effectively by just internalizing the climate crisis or sort of biodiversity loss and ecological destruction, just price that into the market appropriately, kind of fiddle with the prices just to get them right. Uh, and, you know, the market will just kind of do what it does and, and eliminate all these issues. Um, and I think that's a, you know, a fundamental misreading um, of just the scale of kind of complexity of this problem, the pace, frankly, that we need to deliver um, and the kind of relationship between the absolute embeddedness of sort of fossil fuels in our economies and unsustainability in the way that we organize our economies. That means that it's not something that like market mechanisms can overcome because they are operating within infrastructures that will simply not allow that to be the case. Um, and so, you know, I evaluate the success of things like existing carbon pricing regimes um, and find, you know, very underwhelming evidence to support their, their progress. And I think, you know, the reason for that is that there is this kind of inescapable relationship between um, sort of carbon emissions or ecological catastrophe and um, sort of huge inequality and sort of the dynamics of capitalism that fundamentally are kind of producing those in the first place. So it's sort of an instance in which you can't kind of address the problem within the system that's creating it. Um, and I think, you know, that's why partly what I do is try to propose that like anything that we pursue in the climate crisis is obviously, you know, appraised first and foremost through the lens of pure effectiveness. You know, does it reduce carbon emissions? Does it reduce environmental degradation, et cetera? But inherently linked to that are questions around, you know, does this combat gross and indefensible levels of inequality, both domestically and internationally? Does it address questions surrounding justice? Does it increase kind of democratic power and um, sort of distribute power um, in the global economy? And that those are questions that aren't just kind of nice to have, but are sort of very fundamental to our ability to do task one, which is sort of cut emissions or, or slow ecological degradation. Um, and that's kind of, I guess, the framework through which the entire book progresses, basically just evaluating what's on the table and, and why I think it's not working. Thanks so much. That was a, that was a great uh, overview of a <laughs> complex argument. And I guess where perhaps I'd like to, to go next would be, I mean, the, the focus of your argument isn't so much on bad faith actors mm. and on corruption and on sort of climate denialism. You're sort of getting into the sort of murky kind of subterranean realm of how, in a way, ideas kind of trap us within these routinized, bureaucratized realities. 
uh, sort of this ideological entrapment that you're 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 trying to expose to the light, which mm. reminded me a bit of Amitav Ghosh's work from a different vantage point perhaps but you know at, at, at a, a more fundamental level i wondered to what extent you're really advancing a critique of of liberalism of the project mm. of modernity that seems <laughs> to be a little bit the, the ghost in the book if you will yeah i think that's absolutely right it's it's one of those things that you probably can't say about your own i am here to take on modernity but <laughs> Um, but I think I think your point about liberalism is is absolutely right, which is, you know, fundamentally what I'm engaging with are ideas and ideologies, frankly, that kind of enclose us within the boundaries of what we deem to be possible um, in a way that is incredibly kind of destructive and unnecessarily self-limiting. So, you know, some of what I talk about is kind of the sort of mainstream economics, to use a simple term to describe it, that informs, you know, models around, you know, what's an optical degree or of global warming, right? So there's this kind of cleavage to ideas that are fundamentally kind of ill-equipped to deal with this crisis. And that's how you end up with things like the very famous DICE model, for which uh, William Nordhaus won the sort of quasi-Nobel Prize in economics. Um, and, you know, it prescribes variably between like a three and four degree Celsius warmed world as sort of economically optimal based on models that adhere to sort of very, very kind of purist uh, economic appraisals of the world um, and completely exclude anything that can't sort of be valued in, in monetary terms um, and prioritize, you know, purely economic outcomes over what a lot of us actually value, which are things that you can't sort of put a price on and whether that's your health, whether that's well-being, whether that's thriving ecosystems, you know, all of these things are totally excluded from that worldview. Uh, and the same goes with, you know, the kind of neoliberal, broadly more liberal kind of frameworks that, that you mentioned before, which is that, you know, again, we've completely clear to the idea that the only way to sort of address this is through, you know, adjustments in the market and, and that that's the ultimate kind of democratic arbiter because people are supposedly kind of free and fair to exchange in the market and, and what have you. Um, and also critically with neoliberalism that, you know, the key project is to kind of insulate the, the economic sphere from sort of democratic demands for sort of redistribution for economic justice. And that's a an idea that I'm borrowing from Quinn Slobodian, uh, who's a sort of Canadian American academic. Um, his book Globalists, very good, highly recommend it. Um, and you know, I think those are both kind of irreconcilable with a world in which we achieve some degree of kind of long-term durable sustainability, but also kind of climate and ecolog ecological justice. Because if you are deliberately insulating the markets through kind of neoliberalism and neoliberal governance techniques um, from sort of democracy and democratic demands, you're never going to address the kind of core problems around inequality and justice that, you know, I argue in the book are, are critical to the material question around cutting carbon emissions, around long-term kind of sustainability and reduced, you know, resource throughput and, and all those questions. Um, so yeah, absolutely. General, general attack on on sort of market supremacy, but perhaps kind of liberalism writ large, um, trying to embrace the kind of messiness of politics in this space. <laughs> yeah, I know it's, it's good to see an effort to try and grapple with that collision of different domains, because often the climate space can seem very technocratic, a uh, lot of jargon, a lot of economic <laughs> jargon. And of course, you know, you go into great depth and in, in sort of pulling apart and teasing out some of the, the problematic assumptions that are built into, say, the uh, environmental, uh, social governance <laughs> issues, uh, the the carbon offsetting systems, and, you know, even the sort of language of effectiveness, right? I mean, effectiveness is kind of an invitation to retreat into abstraction, because obviously it implies you know, the cost benefit analysis. It implies some kind of Pareto optimal outcome. Mm -hmm. But as you suggest, I mean, it, it, once you get into the, the, the justice concerns, you might find that many of the, the trade offs, they're not really trade offs. They're more incommensurate values. There's, they're, they're, it's not possible to really compare and contrast uh, the claims of, say, indigenous communities in Ecuador, wherever it may be, and, mm -hmm. and the, the interest array that you find in Geneva or, or in New York. Uh, and I mean, the, I think the other point which really comes through in the book, and it's, it's really, really important, is just that ideas really do have a concrete 
impact in the world. And there's a, a point where you say, you know, that we've sustained Western lifestyles off the exploitation of invisible people in places around the world. And so you wonder to what extent the to the the ide- ideological kind of, uh, matrix has yeah. allowed us to ignore, to to in- invisibilize, if you will, to turn that into a verb. And it's not just people, say, in the global south, but but also um, you know future generations. Again, as as Vinayupta said on this on this podcast, you know, mm-hmm. in many ways we are stealing from from the future. Mm-hmm. So uh, I guess if we're thinking about the future and you, you mentioned Nordhaus and in the book, you know, you, you quote him, he says, there's basically no alternative to the market solution. <laughs> and another theme which has been running through this podcast is, is sort of the Mark Fisher notion that the future mm-hmm. is cancelled. Yeah. So mm-hmm. what do we take from the book in terms of how do we begin to actually move towards a more habitable, a more life-affirming future? How do we actually change the terms of the debate to begin to have that conversation? Yeah, very challenging (laughs) to do. Um, These are views and ideas that are so profoundly entrenched and naturalized that I think even for those of us who sort of engage with them, you know, on a daily basis for work or in study, um, it often feels like they are sort of just like handed down kind of deus ex machina style. They're completely immutable. And, you know, even in the book, I and I catch myself out on this in the text itself. You know, I'm engaging with these ideas in the kind of language of the ideas themselves rather than trying to kind of break out of the kind of limiting frameworks that, that we have. Um, I think one of the things that I try to do is, you know, you'll note at the end of the book, there isn't like a list of here's a bunch of alternative solutions um, because I find those challenging (laughs) Um, at the end of books where you've had sort of 10 chapters of critique and then sort of a very quick list of things that might be better. Um, And so instead, what I try to do is get us, I guess, to return to kind of like first principles. And this might all sound a bit wishy-washy, but I don't think it is insofar as often in policymaking, whether it's environmental or economic policymaking, you know, we start without even questioning from the position of what are our frameworks for appraising the world? What are the rules we think we have to follow? And then we figure out how the outcomes that we want to see can kind of be sort of wedged into those frameworks. Uh, And I think that's the exact kind of inverse of the approach that we need to be taking, particularly around climate and ecological crisis, which is, you know, what are the outcomes that we need and want to see? What are the values that we all share? What are the things that we cherish? And how can we use the like incredible wealth and technology and political resources and infrastructures that we have already built and that are readily available to us to deliver those rather than you know start from here's our list of kind of confines we operate in and maybe we can get a couple of those things at the end. And so that's kind of the approach I think that should be kind of spread throughout policymaking. And I think, you know, spending a lot of time doing policy isn't you know the way that we uh, you know approach these problems at all and i think that could be sort of a fundamental shift in in the way policy making is done and also in the way that sort of people engage with the climate crisis because i mean again i find myself all the time thinking you know wouldn't it be great if we could have a completely decarbonized energy system and oh but that you know can't happen on this time frame because you know this is how the system is set up and this is how the market operates and you know, it's very easy to fall into the pattern of just kind of narrowing your view of what is possible and achievable to the incredibly limiting, unnecessarily so kind of confines of the world that we've kind of built for ourselves ideologically. And so that's, I guess, the biggest recommendation that the book offers is for everyone to kind of think about, you know, what is it that we actually value? And, you know, what would we ideally want to see? in a world and a future that isn't just kind of livable livable but is one that is you know worth living in and is is better arguably to live in for most people than our current one um and that speaks to your point about invisible people right is that you know the reason it's easy for people like us to sort of imagine the end of the world rather than the end of capitalism is that you know our lives frankly are relatively sheltered and cushioned and so it's hard to imagine a system that is radically different from the one that we're in but for you know, the world's poor majority, often on the front lines of climate crisis, you know, the end of the world isn't some kind of imagined distant future. It's something that is rapidly kind of advancing on you. And so the necessity of an, of imagining an end to capitalism or, you know, an end to the current system um, is much more sharp. And I think that's kind of the energy that we need to be kind of channeling and the position we need to be starting from. 
as William Gibson said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed, which I do yeah. like to drop into my my seminars on climate governance. Yeah. It's a it's a perfect quote. Yeah. <laughs> what he said. I just said it in 500 <laughs> words instead of five. <laughs> I agree completely that building the the world that we we want to value and and uh, and and trying to vi- visualize an outcome and and build our policy systems around that outcome is is such an important place to start. I am curious about um, your ideas on whether or not capitalism as a system can even accommodate a shift in value, uh, whether or not we're looking to scratch the system altogether and build a new. Um, because in a lot of ways, and feel free to disagree with me, but um, uh, capitalism is built on exploitation. Um, and yeah. is it even possible for us to have a more humanitarian, for lack of a better word, um, ideal when building capitalist systems? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I would fall into your camp, um, which is that, you know, I think exactly as you said, because this is a system that, you know, demands and requires exploitation to continue to reproduce itself. You know, I think that going forward, it is completely non-viable if the principle we're starting from is we want a world in which broadly, you know, everyone has the means to live like a comfort, comfortable, fulfilled life in which, you know, we aren't teetering on the cliff edge of a climate crisis in which, you know, biodiversity loss is not only halted, but reversed. You know, all of these things are, I think, kind of fundamentally irreconcilable with with uh, sort of market dynamics and with capitalism as a system. And, you know, carbon offsets are a perfect example of this just as like a microcosm, right? So one of the phrases that I use in the book, um, which I borrow from Serva Storm, who's a really brilliant academic, is that capitalism is sort of an externalizing machine. So what carbon pricing working within the market kind of framework is supposed to do is, again, sort of internalize the issue of carbon emissions to the market. But the problem is that that increases costs for actors in the market who, by dint of operating under a capitalist system, are incredibly effective at and will do everything in their power to find new ways to externalize other costs. And so the whole system of carbon offsets is a perfect example of that, right? So not only do you end up with kind of outrageous maths like you know, Shell saying that it's going to need an area three times the size of the Netherlands just for its own 2030 offset targets. Um, And, you know, quickly add that up and obviously the run out of land very quickly for the world. Um, But it also, you know, creates huge externalities in terms of often driving biodiversity loss, often, you know, enabling carbon emissions to go ahead, accounted for as if they're offset, but, you know, then the offset goes up in flames or it's an offset that already existed in the first place and so you're not actually adding anything. But additionally, you know, what it does is continue the kind of exploitation and devaluation of certain human lives and certain forms of life around the world through sort of massive land grabs and sort of expropriation of indigenous peoples from their lands in order to service the kind of demands of global kind of economic growth and this massively concentrated engine of kind of wealth that we have. Um, And so, yeah, I think, you know, in doing so, it's going to create entirely new problems that continue to contribute to the overall crisis we're facing and that dynamic is incompatible with one that actually kind of resolves the crisis we set it to do in the first place and in the process will create a lot of harm so i definitely would kind of fall into your camp which is that you know fundamentally this is a system designed to exploit designed to kind of cut costs wherever possible in order to kind of maximize profit that just is the overall motive that guides our system um and that is kind of irreconcilable with any of the kind of first principle goals that we might have kind of set out at the beginning which obviously puts you in an uncomfortable position because the urgency of the task at hand kind of creates this obviously very exhausting kind of cognitive dissonance around this is a system that is incompatible with a just and sustainable future any future really this is the system that we have now. It is an incredibly slow moving beast. How do we, is it worth trying to change it or do you just kind of have to, you know, move beyond it? And I'm not sure I have, have the answer to that. I obviously work in a job where I try and change the system that we have. Um, but then I, I write about abolishing it all together. So I'm not sure I have the, <laughs> the answers for you there, but um, probably broadly agree with your position. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I, I I think we can all agree that we're not uh, looking for you to provide uh, the be all end all answers. This The podcast <laughs> the conversation is really just about exploring the conversation. And <laughs> all that because if we, we had the answer, then uh, I think we'd be in a better position than we are right now. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think you mentioned earlier about the kind of 
the separation between uh, you know the, the Western patterns of thinking and mm. uh, in, in many ways these invisible people that we were speaking about, which are predominantly found in the global south. So uh, the the product of, of the dominant of Western ideology in our global system has been solutions that fall within the capitalist realm, as you were speaking about carbon offsets. It's a wonderful example. Um, so going back to our global governance roots, I suppose. Um, uh, how would you envision a, a, a forum or, or an avenue to equalize the conversation and allow for invisible people to no longer be invisible and to provide solutions that would, would be more beneficial uh, on a global scale? Yeah, I mean, God, big question again. I think, um, I think what I would say is that I don't know that I have kind of like, here's the alternative single kind of institution or or infrastructure that could deliver this. I do think there are the seeds of kind of alternative models out there um, and they kind of offer a lot of room for kind of excitement and optimism around basically, yeah, not completely marginalizing the voices of people that tend to be on the front lines of this crisis. Um, one of the first and very easy things that we could do, I mean, easy in a kind of, it's an easy thing to describe, but probably challenging to do is obviously kind of <laughs> eliminate the role of kind of corporate and sort of financial system influence over politics, right? So you have like major financial firms that are always consistently the partners of, you know, United Nations discussions or um, any kind of international institutions or, you know, even domestic governments, whether it's the US and the UK, you've got big financial firms like BlackRock, you know, hugely influencing policy. Um, and I think immediately kind of eliminating their kind of completely outsized voice in politics. And that includes both, you know, political donations, but also kind of direct lobbying and influence um, is just a absolutely critical first step to having a politics that resembles anything like a true kind of representative democracy. Um, but more broadly, I think, you know, there are certain examples, um, sort of legacy examples, whether that's, you know, the Cochabamba People's Agreement, which came out in 2010, which was basically an alternative to what was trying to be achieved at sort of uh, Copenhagen, whatever cop that was, I always forget the numbers, 15, was that 2009? Um, and was basically, you know, governments broadly from the global south coming together to say, you know, this is what uh, the equivalent of what then became the Paris Agreement would look like if it was sort of a globally just agreement that reflected uh, kind of the needs of uh, the, the world, like the planet, but also of kind of people whose voices don't tend to be centered and who broadly aren't heard. Um, and there's, I think, a lot of lessons to be taken from just the effort and, and the ideas that were there and the kind of worldviews presented in that document. Um, and then there are also lots of people kind of organizing around the world to um, sort of bring together, again, marginalized voices on mainstream stages, whether that's groups like the Progressive International, who you may or may not have heard of, who basically try to sort of coordinate progressive movements and trade unions and other kind of forces all around the world and could hear them around sort of a collective project of, of emancipation. I think that kind of work is really exciting. Um, and I'm sure there are other examples, but I'm just kind of <laughs> blocking on them right now. Um, but those would be, I guess, three starting points um, of things that I find kind of encouraging. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's always important to highlight that, which is encouraging in a, in a sea of what often feels very, <laughs> very not encouraging. At all. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think uh, Tom had a question. Tom H. Oh, it's Tom. Yes, I just going back briefly to the the critique of capitalism and, and the environment just reminds me of Nancy Fraser's like climates of capital piece, which is so great for anyone that hasn't read it in the New Left Review with the the four Ds where like capitalism makes like humans depend on nature, but then divides them ontologically, and then they disavow the ecological costs until they stack up and destabilize the entire system. It's just a really nice brief kind of yeah, capitalism and nature they don't get on. Um, but my question I wanted to ask was you in your role currently in this think tank and also previously you presumably talk to people that, that have power and you talk to people in positions of you know great influence do, do they get it do they understand you know are they like trust do they understand do they get it or do they really not and they they're willingly blind you said that it's not nefarious actors but mm. Are, are they listening to you? Do they recognize how close the catastrophe is or how we're in the middle of it now or it's beginning? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, 
I think broadly, no, in terms of really getting it, no. And I'll caveat that by saying, you know, it's hard to say that, you know, I get it or any of us get it right. Because as I said before, we are kind of comparatively, you know, sheltered from this crisis and we can do the best we can to try and understand its scale and its magnitude. Um, but we'll never really know what it's like to be on the sharp end of this crisis. So the best we can do is, you know, try and agitate as much as we can. Um, I think that broadly people in positions of power fall very quickly prey to the exact dynamics that we've been talking about around, you know, just operating in a system for so long that relatively small concessions feel like big wins and kind of losing sight of the kind of scale and urgency of this problem. Um, I think there are, and maybe this again sounds like a bit of a twee thing to say, I think there are many more kind of earnest and well-intentioned people um, trying to work on this problem than there are kind of nefarious actors. Um, and I think that's, you know, broadly true across the world, whether that's, you know, the work I used to do um, sort of advising, you know, financial firms on how they could make their portfolios more sustainable. You know, that's a system that I think is fundamentally flawed and I unpack that in the book. But I think broadly, there were a lot of, people in that space who genuinely wanted to find a way to, to do good and to make a difference. Um, and I think that is quite true across the board. I think politicians broadly um, have, at least in the UK, have completely lost sight of, you know, the kind of wisdom, and I'll, I'll quote Stuart Hall here, that, you know, politics does not reflect majorities, it constructs them. And that, I think, is sort of an insight that we've completely forgotten, which is that, in the UK in particular, you know, politics is so obsessed with responding to where public opinion currently is. And the Labour Party in particular really falls into that box of feeling as though it needs to respond to what people currently think rather than try to change their minds. That's something that I think Corbyn tried to do, right, which is completely change people's minds from where they currently are and to shift the dial. Um, and I think that is something that will absolutely need to happen if we're going to kind of act on the climate crisis. And I should say, you know, the political right is very good at that. They've never forgotten that lesson. You know, you can take something like Brexit, where, you know, it was a completely fringe issue that, you know, almost no one in the British public thought about and moved to become the single most kind of salient political question in an election in a very, very short amount of time. And that just came from someone saying, I'm going to make this the political issue and doing it. And so we have contemporary examples where that happens all the time. But I think that progressives, because you tend to be on the back foot, have completely forgot that that is a role that they have to fill. Um, and that, frankly, it's an effective way of, of doing politics is to give people something that inspires them and sort of awakens their mind. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think anyone right now on the kind of progressive side of politics is doing that enough, at least people that are kind of in, in positions of power right now. Um, so that's something that I think really needs to, needs to change. And there are examples coming out of the new and if a bit patchy kind of pink tide around two uh, in South America. Um, and I think that'll be an interesting space to watch around completely kind of different ways of doing politics and kind of the narratives that the progressive leaders kind of espouse, but TBD. Yeah, it's challenging because often the the critics sort of get tired with that brush or, well, we know what you're against, but what are you for? <laughs> exactly. Uh, I mean, I, I'm also curious to to ask, and I think perhaps ties a bit Tom's reflection and the broader issues around how capitalism is a a, a a mindset. I mean, it's something which is deeply penetrated into the culture. I mean, this uh, this uh, analyst Per Espen Stockness has said that uh, you know it, the, the current version of capitalism um, may be wrecking havoc, but it's not capitalism that's broken. And denying the human psyche its subconscious yearning for growth would be disastrous. Um, so, in that sense, he's arguing that essentially capitalism is is a, a natural uh, accompaniment to to kind of the those deeper instinctive mm -hmm. human drives, uh, and that I suppose would manifest among certain, should we say, segments of 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 social forces powerful elites and i mean i, I when i was reading the book I mean, you 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 emphasize that you're not focused on sort of bad faith actors 
but mm. the quote by John Maynard Keynes did, did come to mind. Uh, mm. People of privilege will always risk their complete destruction rather than surrender any material part of their advantage. Mm. And, um, you know, I think that's not only, that doesn't only hold up a mirror to, to elites. It might also hold up a mirror to an awful lot of, let's say, you know, middle class Westerners who, who are used to a, a highly materialistic, high consumption lifestyle. Mm. Um, so I was curious to ask, I mean, how do you, how do we begin to have that conversation? <laughs> the, I, I tend to be quite skeptical of any kind of proclamation that things like a drive for growth are somehow inherent to the human psyche. I don't think anyone really has that answer. Um, and I think that's broadly kind of one of the tools that's been used to kind of prop up capitalism and or market-based systems, right? This idea that, you know, this is completely rational to how humans are motivated and how we're sort of hardwired. I think there are lots of examples and studies that kind of suggest that that may sometimes be true, but we are also very hardwired to be very sort of communitarian and to be sort of much more altruistic as a species. And so I don't think it's ever easy to just say, this is how we work and therefore we'll organize the system in that way. Um, and I think the question around sort of material well-being and lifestyles, right, comes down to some very uncomfortable questions that we need to answer around um, sort of global distribution of wealth and sort of resource use. Um, but fundamentally, I think, you know, a lot of the things that we think people might not be willing to kind of yield um, are things that actually people when they don't have them, don't really miss. And I'll point to one of my favorite kind of studies around that, which was a recent study, and I can send it to you if you want to kind of link it in the show notes, around private car ownership. And basically that if people were given the opportunity to kind of voluntarily give up their vehicle, uh, they were much happier for it. <laughs> you know, people were actively happier without having private car ownership. Meanwhile, we're completely obsessed with this idea that the only way to win the climate fight is that if everyone can have an EV instead, potentially, and that we're unwilling to kind of yield the dominance of the, the individual car uh, in this fight. And so I think we take for granted that broadly, you know, what people value most in their lives aren't necessarily, you know, material things. And then I think broadly people care about you know, time with their friends and family. They care about, you know, free time to exist outside of work. They care about, you know, basic material security. Um, but a lot of this comes down to kind of false kind of positional dynamics that we've created that don't reflect some kind of inherent motivation uh, in the human mind. And that, frankly, a lot of us could have a life that is much better than the one we currently live with, you know, much less kind of resource use and, and material throughput and, you know, carbon emissions associated with it. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Adrian, for your time and, and all your insights and your fantastic book, which I will definitely be including on on my syllabus. <laughs> oh, it's, thank you. it's a real joy to 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 see you again, and uh, yeah, wish you so the much. very best with all of your work. and And we'll we'll be in touch. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys, and enjoy your sabbatical. Thank you. <laughs> I, <am. laughs> I mean, clearly, you know, not fully stopping work, but <laughs> I mean, only doing the fun things like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for tuning in to Imperfect Utopias or Bust, Global Governance Futures. If you liked this content, please do leave us a comment and subscribe. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favorite books, other resources, listen to past shows, and to join our community, go to ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance.